This old amusement park has been closed since the 80s, and it's now being reclaimed by nature. If you want to see what it looks like today, then all you need to do is come along with me. Today, we're taking a ride back to the past. A place that's been gone for decades, but isn't forgotten. A place known as Rocky Glen Amusement Park. A park that I not only visited as a kid, but have made several videos on over the years. Here in 2023, we're gonna see what the reclaimed land looks like now, point out a few familiar things, and at the same time, see how this e-bike performs. This is known as the U-Bike S4, and later on in the video, I'll tell you more about it. But right now, Let's get an updated look at the former Rocky Glen Amusement Park. I'll see you at Rocky Glen Park this weekend. The beginning of the video started in the upper parking lot. We're now coming down this road, which will bring us to, I guess you could consider it the picnic or pavilion area. There was one ride here, which I'm going to point out to you. And there was some Homes at one time, I think for the owner. Now we are essentially up above and behind the beach area of the lake. It'd be down to our right. As you can see, there is a foundation there made out of stone, stone steps. But in the back part here, was a ride and a lot of people didn't know about it if they came and came to the park in later years another foundation here off to our right may have been the home site but back here was a train ride a miniature train ride And it actually went quite a ways back. Myself and my friend Andy, who is the administrator, historian of the Rocky Glen Memories Facebook group, have documented it. But the train ride did come back here and looped around. Actually had a tunnel as well. And that ride operated up until the 1950s. But that ride still exists. And you can still ride it today. That's because the Clifford Township Fire Department now owns that train and they operated at their annual fireman's picnic. I've ridden on it as well as many others. I've even made videos on it. So that is a piece of Rocky Glen history that is still surviving today. Still looks primarily the same. They may have changed out the motor in it, but when you see the photos of when it was operating here at the park and how it looks today at Clifford, you can tell it's the same train. Now Rocky Glen Park opened all the way back in 1903, but it didn't start off with rides. It had a similar start as Knobles, where it started off with the water source. So at the lake here, in 1903, it opened and attracted people who came ice skating. Rides didn't first appear until 1904. Heading down this road now is going to bring us right down to the beach area. It was known as Sandy Beach. It was a very popular swimming area. It had slides, it had a pool house, even had slides out in the water. And it was a perfect place to come and cool off on those hot summer days here in Pennsylvania. And we do have a downed tree. We should be able to fit underneath it. And just like that, we are now down here at the beach. And the name holds true. It was a sandy beach and still is. This is all sand we're currently riding on. And I've come swimming here after the park was closed hundreds of times probably, 
even brought my kid here when they were younger and have a lot of great memories not only when the park wasn't open here coming down here to watch the fireworks but to also come here swimming after the park was closed now the way you see the lake right now is not how it always looked the lake is actually drained but it's actually higher than it was in previous times if that makes sense so just to kind of explain the water line normally came up to here i would say where this hump is the water line started right there so we're, we'd be standing right here we'd be under a couple feet of water maybe three to four feet at most but this was a sandy bottom and it just gradually went out deeper and deeper well at the end of 2018 this lake was drained they ended up opening up the valve house over by the outlet opening up the valves and water came out through the pipes and dropped the levels significantly to the point that things that were on the bottom of the lake that were never seen before were now exposed not only dozens of tree stumps but random items as well and we'll talk more about that later but the levels dropped and it was a site that hardly anyone has ever seen. I think it's only been drained a handful of times. Now the reason it was drained was reportedly for dam remediation. The dam was in desperate need of repair. It hasn't been maintained in a few decades and they reported that they drained it so they could do work on it to make it safer. Well, that work, as far as I know, never took place. The dam had no work done to it since 2018 and the levels have never come back up, except for now. And there's a reason why the water levels are higher. And I'm gonna show you that in a little bit, not only showing you, but explaining why, because there's a really definitive reason as to why the water levels are higher now. When I was here earlier this summer, I was able to walk out probably another 30 feet or so, and it was dry ground. So the water is up a decent amount. And there's one lone goose swimming out there. Now again, this would be underwater normally this is all dry and exposed since the lake has been lowered came a little further back just to show you one more example of how the water levels have changed so i'm going to show you a picture from earlier this summer where i was out here with my bike and i was nearly halfway across the water but there was no water, it was a dry patch of land because right there was an underground pipe which does run just beneath the surface of this lake. And that pipe sometimes is exposed, most times it's just a couple inches under the water, but the land is high enough, the water is low enough so you can get out pretty much right in front of it. Well, I can't even find it at this point where it is. It's somewhere out here I want to say maybe by those weeds sticking out directly in front of us. It could be over here, but it's under several feet of water now, so I can't even identify the location. But that's just another example showing that the water has risen several feet from earlier this year. Now coming up this way is going to bring us to a concrete base or foundation. That's because there were some things that were located here when the park was in operation. We're now on top of the concrete and it's being reclaimed by nature as expected, but there are some things still visible if you know where to look. Right here you can see the concrete is sloping downwards. Well, typically water would be right around here. That would be the water line. So here's a good visual as to how low it is, but it was even lower back in 2018. 
But as we turn around and you look directly in front of us, do you see anything? Anything that stands out to you? Probably not. Not until you get a bit closer. Right here is a pool. This is the giveaway here. Rectangular shape, still got the blue liner, the filters, and now it's inhabited by these cattails, what are, or what I call nature's corn dogs. It's also loaded with garbage. So this was not a swimming pool. This was a pool for slides. There were slides that were erected above it and they spiral down and you splash down into the pool. If I could find a photo, I will insert it, but yes, this was indeed built for slides here at the Sandy Beach area. And I believe over here was a pool house where they had an area to get changed. And out in the lake, they had not only a floating dock that did exist, well, after the park closed, it used to just float around and you'd find it in various places. But they also had a tall slide out in the lake too, where you would swim out to it, climb the ladder, and slide right down into the lake. So they had a multitude of things to do as far as cooling off here at Rocky Glen. Now, if we were to look the rear portion of the lake, it actually does shallow out. It's uh, a lot of tree stumps back there. This is a man-made lake, but this is a naturally fed lake. The water that feeds this is known as Stafford Meadow Brook. It actually comes down from a reservoir farther away. But this is actually pretty clean, clear water that feeds this lake. And when I used to come swimming here, the water was like bath water and it was really clear. The deepest part of the lake was around 20, maybe 25 feet. I've actually snorkeled this lake too and filmed it, showing you what was underneath it. And at most times you can see directly to the bottom, regardless of how deep it was. So it was rather fascinating to me to be able to see so clear and to wonder, you know, what's in the depths of the water. It wasn't very deep, but it was deep enough for boats because they had not only the paddle boats here that you could take out from the dock, which I'll show you where that's located, but they also had a river boat and a dragon boat or a sea dragon. So they had boat rides here, personal little boats, the paddle boats. They also used to do, I believe, water skiing shows and other shows on the lake from boats. And they actually had a designated seating area because prior to the 1950s, this lake was actually larger than it is now. So once we do get over there, I'll tell you more about that. Another thing I wanted to point out too was the beauty of the park, which also still stands today. Tons of stonework. A stone wall right here. And even right here, even though it's falling apart, it's still very visible. These stone steps going up here. So these steps would connect you from the sandy beach area up to the top to the picnic pavilion area where we were earlier. But these types of things are seen throughout the park. We're going to see more of them as we make our way through different areas. But just fantastic to see that they were built so well that they're still lasting today, decades after the park closed. Where we're riding right now would be inside of a building. This had a multitude of uses and different names, but essentially it was a dance hall and a penny arcade. And it was also part of the Western Town, because at one time this was called Ghost Town in the Glen. But this is a large foundation here, right along the lake's edge, and people remember it as different things from different time frames. And right here, the water would be probably halfway up this wall, so the water would be several feet deep, deep enough for a boat. And all this vegetation obviously wasn't here. It was just water, clear water. Looking across, though, back in the 1950s, the view was much different. There was a gigantic coaster right here known as the Million Dollar Coaster. And, well, it didn't cost a million dollars. It only cost $100,000 to construct. But, as we know, parks, businesses, and just people all around like to kind of talk things up, hype them up, make them seem larger and grander than they are. So they hyped it saying it's the million dollar coaster. Come ride our brand new million dollar coaster. Little did they know it only cost a hundred grand. But 
it was one of the largest coasters, if not the largest coaster ever constructed at that time. It was significant to this park. It was a grand wooden coaster and I wish I was able to ride it when it was here. Wish I was here back in that time. But what I can tell you though is that it had a short life. Started in 1945. By 1957, it was done. And you may be asking, well, if it was such a grand coaster, why does it have such a short life? Well, simply put, due to the location. Many of the supports and footings and other things connected to the coaster were submerged in the lake. Intentionally, they wanted it to have a lakeside coaster, which looked fantastic. There's some great photos of it. I can only imagine the views when you're riding it. But that was one of its downfalls. So being submerged in water for years took its toll. Not only that, Northeast Pennsylvania, especially going back long ago, had some very brutal winters. Really harsh cold temperatures, lots of snow. So those things combined basically rotted away the supports of the coaster and just became too costly to maintain. So 1957, that coaster was gone. But there were other coasters here. And what I'm telling you and what I'm sharing with you is very brief because there's extensive history tied to this park. And I've learned a lot over the last few years, but I only know a little bit compared to what's out there. But what I'm sharing with you is what I learned not only from the Rocky Glen Memories Facebook group that I'm a member of, but also coming here with my friend Andy to help him give group tours, showing people where things were, talking about the history and dates, because a lot took place here over different time frames and different eras and different decades. But Andy's actually helped me as we speak with this video. He's providing me with dates and some photos so that I could give you the most accurate and detailed information I can in this video. So what I'm sharing with you is basically what I know and what I'm familiar with and what he's able to help me with. But there were a few or I should say several different coasters and a lot of like side side trails that goes off of those dates like you know of who owned what what came from where it, it you can really get down a rabbit hole so i'm just keeping it very brief very you know easy to kind of coordinate and to share with you guys but we have a lot more to see and i don't want this video to be too entirely long so let's keep moving Are you looking for a fun gift idea for someone that you know? Or maybe you want a personalized video that you get to keep forever? If so, click my Cameo link down below in the description. So what we're looking at right here was known as the Western Town, at least for a period of time here in the Rocky Glen operational days. Penny Arcade, dance hall right there. Then there was different structures and facades here. But the one that stands out to most people that they remember was right here known as the Swiss Cottage. It was a beautiful looking structure that unfortunately burned down and it's basically remnants of it buried here. But you can still see some of the stonework that was part of it still standing. This was part of the Swiss Cottage. I actually believe it had an apartment in it as well where guests or musicians or even the actors for the gun show would stay in. They actually did have gunfights with the Western cowboys or actors. Fictitious, of course, but still nonetheless, they had them. But speaking of artists and musicians, did you know that Rocky Glen was host to some very famous up and coming musicians? Well, famous now, not so famous at the time. Two people that I'm gonna mention that you may be really surprised to, to believe that they actually performed here. First, was Bon Jovi. Yes, Bon Jovi performed here. I believe is when his first album was released. He performed here at Rocky Glen and also Meatloaf. And there's actually a lot of people that belong to the Facebook Memories group that have either seen them in concert here or have the ticket stubs or something else to solidify that. But yes, famous artists and musicians like that that we know today and have enjoyed their music did perform here when they were up and coming. So that's pretty incredible to uh, learn those type of little tidbits of information. Right over here too is another area I wanted to point out. It's along the lake's edge of course and it was my personal swimming hole when I came here because it did have a relatively sandy bottom. 
Well, at least it used to. Yeah, it's over here. Here's a sandy bottom, and we may see some posts sticking out. And the posts continue right here. And there's a wall here. Well, the reason for this is because this was a dock. That was the edge of the, the shore there, the land. And you walk out into the dock, and these were the paddle boats were located. So if you wanted to take a paddle boat out onto the lake, this is where you boarded them, right here. But yes, this was nice and clear and open back in, I would say, close to 10 years ago probably, maybe um, a little less than that. But you'd be able to come right down here into the lake. I used to come swimming here, I snorkeled here. And this is actually where I started my snorkeling adventure that I mentioned. I started by the building there, came around, showed all this underwater, made my way to the corner or to the channel there. So really fascinating to see it both underwater and exposed now. Now you may be looking right here and seeing this rather deep pool of water. And there's a reason why it's a deep pool of water. Well, this was the area of the high dive act. And I believe that the high dive or diving board is still in there. When this was dry and exposed, I was able to see it. It might be in a previous video, but this is filled up now as mentioned. But when I seen this dry, this is a deep dugout pit deeper than the rest of the lake because they had the high dive act right here. So they, the high diver would climb up the ladder, come out and dive into a ra rather deep pool of water just so it was safe. But yeah, now it's kind of being reclaimed once again by nature and by the rainwaters. But the diving board, I believe, is still there. Up there takes up to the main part of the park where most of the rides were. We will get up there a bit later. Directly in front of us here, there were some structures and some rides. Right here where the pavement is cut out, you can see it going around at a curve. Used to be train tracks here. There was a miniature scale train ride that went around here and actually bordered the million dollar coaster. So million dollar coaster not only was just a coaster on the water's edge, but also had a train ride that went next to it. And also the Laurel Line trolley service next to it as well so that was a very busy area over there with three different things going on a trolley a train and a coaster but the train did come over here probably loaded unloaded somewhere over here the train did change over time but the train route was still primarily the same and there was actually three trains that operated here i believe there is this one down here by the lake there's the one up top which we mentioned is now at clifford township fire department and there's one which was near the mighty jet coaster. So there was three trains. I don't know if they all operate at the same time or not, but there definitely was three separate distinct trains that did operate here at Rocky Glen. On this side over here, there's a few different things, a lot of stonework and some different elevations because there was seating over here. Up here through the trees, which is gonna be really hard to see, is a foundation. And this foundation, was called the Red Barn. And the Red Barn was a music stage. So it had a barn style look to it. And guests would sit on the different embankments or levels facing the stage to listen or watch the music and shows. So it's right up there is a teal colored foundation, which was the foundation right there of the Red Barn right here. So guests would sit up there facing down this way the stage faced away from the lake but as mentioned there's just tons of stonework and just some things just mixed in different levels steps platforms if you come in the winter time you can definitely see a lot more than you can now but also nature is just really taking it over if you came here even when we had the group tours you're able to see a lot more you can even see some old conduit right here. Maybe Bobby would have had a light or something, maybe. And these pathways go in all different directions. This one leads directly to the Red Barn. But over here are these benches, as I was explaining. And there's actually uh, a few different rows of them. And there's other levels up there. But these were here 
because of water shows. Well, if you can believe, which I didn't at first until Andy explained it and we saw visuals on maps, the water used to come up to here. So this land that we're on was added later on. Prior to the 1950s, the water's edge was pretty much right there where the bike is. So the lake was bigger, water came up closer, and allowed a perfect view sitting here of seeing them perform on the lake, whether it was performances on boats, like dancing, or maybe water skiing, or whatever it was, but they had performances here, and the lake was bigger. In the 1950s, they wanted to expand the park, so they filled in this part here, this corner of the lake, and made it land, and they were able to put some more rides down here and some different structures. Heading back towards the outlet dam area now, which was the location of another coaster known as the Mountain Dips Coaster. Looking right now at what is called the outlet and the dam spillway is right over there. This view did look different through a different time periods. So on the back side of the dam levee or spillway was the Mountain Dips Coaster and operated from 1920 to 1939. So this was a coaster that operated even before the Million Dollar Coaster. And it was located right back there. And there's literally nothing left of it today. The landscape has been transformed and altered. But even prior to the lake being drained, the water level was obviously up to the spillway. So there's a deeper part of water here. And it went down I would say depth wise when it was full, probably 15 to 20 feet. Actually it does look like there's um, something down there in the water right now. It looks like maybe part of a bathtub or something. But the drainage pipes are right over there. So there's a little cleared out section with the post standing there. Those are the pipes that they opened up on the other side of the levee wall was the valve house, which they did basically demolish or deconstruct. I will give you a shot of that over there, but the water drains through here, through the spillway or levee, and comes out the other side. That's how they were able to lower the water levels by opening up those pipes. Another thing to note too is that when this first drained in 2018, myself and Andy came here. And this was, I think, December 2018. We were one of the first people to come here and basically see how it looks now, which was, again, a sight to see. It was really fascinating to see the drained lake. Well, we actually were walking along the edge of the outlet here, and we saw, it looked like a, uh, a frame of something, like a ride. Well, upon going down to it, turning it over, closer inspection, it turned out to be a ride vehicle of a whip, a whip car. And we were able to get confirmation of it with a before photo and after. On the bottom it had where the caster wheels would have been. It had the bar that went across like the lap bar in the same shape. People thought it was maybe a bumper car or something else, but it was, I think it was made by the pretzel company who makes uh, ride vehicles. But it was indeed a whip car that somehow made its way down into the bottom of the lake here, specifically the outlet area. It's been gone for a while now. Someone I think actually came and took it. And it would be fascinating if they were able to kind of reconstruct it, make it how it used to be. But it was basically just a shell and frame of itself. Um, but yeah, that was down here in the bottom of the lake. One of the things that we found just days after the lake was drained, that was exposed. And even though I swam in here, and I actually swam, when I snorkeled the lake, I swam all the way through here, right up to the spillway. I swam over that, never knew it was down there. Right now walking on top of the levee wall, dam wall so right down here directly below us you can see the pipes that's where the water is discharging there was a structure here that was built onto the side of this wall and it was just simply known as a valve house but it was made out of stone and inside was those. So when they decided to drain the lake, they deconstructed it and opened up the valves and now the water is flowing through. Where initially, prior to that, the water was 
flowing over the spillway right here. At least that's what it was supposed to do. As mentioned, the dam became very deteriorated and had its issues and water was actually flowing down in between and coming out part way down instead of over the top. So it was in bad need of repair. And as of right now, I don't think anything has been done to it, but this is the normal spillway right here. So looking back, the water level would be right to our feet. So it was a shallower area here and got deeper out there. And I remember too, somewhere over here was a rope swing, big party spot. There was a big tree with a rope so people would swing out and just splash into it. But yeah, not a whole lot going on over here now, just slowly being reclaimed. Essentially riding in the outlet right now, we'd be underwater. And this brings us to the other side, which is its own fascinating area, because there's some more history over here. As we come over this hump, directly in front of us are some train tracks. And you may see some greenery over there. That's a golf course, that's Glenmora Golf Course. And there is some speculation and rumors floating around that Glenmora did buy Rocky Glen. That's not true, Glenmora does not own it. There's a fence line there, that's where the property ends. These train tracks here are part of the Erie Railroad. Erie Railroad is a railroad company that operated here and I've covered different parts of it in Pennsylvania here, I actually have a series I made on it where I covered five different sections of it. This particular section here, going this direction, we'll cross over Montage Mountain Road, go through, go past and through Dunmore, and eventually make its way towards the 380 bridges near the Mount Cobb area. Trains last operated on these rails in the 1980s, and it was Conrail. And now we're gonna ride parallel to them and cover some ground and show you a couple different things. It actually looks quite gorgeous right now with the leaves that are changing and falling down. The trail is just covered in yellow and orange and it's really colorful and vibrant. I'm not sure if it's coming through on camera or not. Gotta make a left here. Head away from the rails, head back down towards the lake. So this right here, that run right now, do you know what this is? To some of you, it may look like a rail bed. Well, it is. This was the Laurel Line Trolley Service Line. This brought passengers to and from Rocky Glen. The line ran from Scranton all the way down to Wilkesbury. The last passengers brought here, I believe, was 1953, but this line was used for freight up until the 1960s. And there were portions of it where you could find railroad ties. And on the other side of Montage Mountain Road, there are still sections of rail. And the Electric City Trolley Museum runs a trolley from Steamtown to PNC Field and Music, and it rides on a section of the old lower line. But the lower line came down here, parallel to the lake. Erie line was up there to the left. And this is how a lot of people came to Rocky Glen back in the day. And as you could probably pick up, 1950s, a lot of things took place, you know. That's when the lower line ended. That's also when the Million Dollar Coaster ended. That's when the lake transformation happened. So 50s was a pivotal time for Rocky Glen. And this is as far as we can go. End of the line. Looking where we just traveled down, there is a break. You cannot continue. And I've seen people make this mistake too. So when I used to come here swimming, over in that area by the paddle boat area. Water would be through here, this is a channel. Well, people on ATVs and dirt bikes would come down here full speed thinking they could just keep going, keep going, keep going. I've seen them literally jam on their brakes and dump their quad right into here. <laughs> and it's actually kind of filled in with debris and material, but it used to be around 10 feet deep. But I remember being here with my brother, he brought his fishing boat through here and got into the outlet area. But this is a channel that connects the lake 
to the outlet. And there would have been a little bridge here for the lower line to cross over. And looking straight ahead, it would have continued straight. And up there towards the outlet near the mountain dips area is where the trolley station was. So passengers would board on board. This would be an overhead walkway platform that when you'd get off, you'd get up, go up the steps, walk over the platform, come down the other side. So over there was a busy area where passengers loaded, unloaded daily for Rocky Glen. But I did want to take you for a little walk down here near the water's edge to point out a few more things and to show you why the lake level is higher because the reason for it is over here. Now right here looking, you see a lot of these concrete footers or supports. These were for the million dollar coaster. So the wooden supports or legs were resting on these or sunken into them. Obviously they're in water. Some of them may have even been deeper. And alongside of here too, was a wooden dock or platform. And there's gonna be some more evidence of that on this side. That's because as I mentioned when we were over there, the train ride, miniature train ride, came along the water's edge. It actually rode on top of a wooden platform like a dock, right next to the coaster, right next to the water. So the train came all the way back here, and I'll show you when we, when we go back where it turned around at. I'm like really shocked how high the water is. This is normally bone dry. Water wouldn't be until around out there somewhere. So more footers. You actually see wood posts. And more wooden posts. So these are the evidence and signs at the wooden dock was here. So just imagine planks of wood on top of it. Train came around a bend this way straight across looped around came back on the same track so this shows the length of not only the coaster but the train ride and here is like i said you can see the wood is encased by the concrete for the coaster and it just got eaten away by the elements very poor design beautiful location but it's just not thought out long term how it's going to hold up all right so if you're wondering why the lake levels are higher i'm going to show you the reason why right now but first just taking that view the water is like glass a couple colors on the trees are popping out reflecting blue skies although it doesn't resemble a park anymore it still is a beautiful location but over here there's something going on, something rather fascinating. So jumping back in time, when I snorkeled this lake, I came along the edge here and this didn't look like this. There was land here. This dip was not here when the lake was full. So it came around like this. In this corner here, there was cribbing which was wood and ties that were just kind of stacked on top of each other, making like a retaining wall. And that was underwater. And I was always fascinated with this corner, wondering why that was here. Why would they have cribbing in the corner of this lake? Well, lo and behold, when they drained this lake, it exposed something. There was an underground culvert. So where this debris pile is and that pole is sticking out, there's a culvert there. That culvert was buried under land. So when I was snorkeling here, there was a culvert that went underneath that connected to the outlet. And we believe it was put in in the 50s because as I mentioned earlier, this land here wasn't here. The lake went all the way up to the wall where we were showing you those benches. They brought the land out, probably installed this culvert and buried it. So this was buried. I have videos of that walking on top of this. But when they drained the lake, they excavated this out and there is indeed a culvert here. I saw both sides of it and now it is plugged up solid. So it's plugged to the point that water can no longer pass through it. Water rose up above it and it's slowly going over the top of it. So water is making its way into the outlet just at a much slower rate. I don't think the water levels are going to be able to get much higher just because now it's naturally spilling over to the other side. Not to say it can't happen, but that's just most likely 
what it's looking like right now. But it was just really fascinating to learn that underneath the water was a culvert pipe. And it wasn't even a pipe, it was made out of stone that went through here and connected the outlet. And it was most likely put in in the 1950s when they did re-alter this landscape and add this material to make it suitable for rides and buildings. So that is pretty much why the water is raising here at Rocky Glen Lake. It's still flowing out out of the pipes as we saw, but it's getting over there much slower. I would say this is probably up, looking at it, at least four to five feet, maybe even more from where I last saw it. And the deepest part of the lake is pretty much right in this area here, around a 20, 25 foot pocket. And that was confirmed when I was here with my brother we were on his fishing boat that had the depth finder. And there was like a little area that went to just over 20 feet. Primarily though, maybe 10 to 15 feet and then shallower further out. One more look at this channel. And you can even see the old water line. Right about there, that's the average water line. And it was deeper than it is now. Probably went down another two to three feet. Maybe even more, but definitely deep enough for both to pass through. I remember people dumped railroad ties in here. They tried making makeshift bridges to cross over and usually they always ended up in here. So it just kind of got plugged up and wasn't as deep as it originally was, but Big stones here, more or less forming an abutment now. Retaining wall slash abutment for the lower line that went directly across here. As we make our way back here, there's actually some more supports of the coaster that you can kind of see right there. Peeking through, there's a big concrete block with multiple wooden posts coming off of it. That was the turnaround loop for the coaster. This was the turnaround loop for the train. And this was known as either Lover's Lane or Lover's Loop or Lover's Island. I can't remember which one. The reason why though is because basically lovers, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, when they came on the train ride, this was the most exclusive remote section of the train ride. And it came around here and you had a bit of privacy. Although this is not an island, it is an outcropping of land. So the train would have came alongside the coaster and I don't know which direction it came as far as the loop, but the loop though does come around here. You can see the open area here, which does circle around and looped around a centerpiece here, which is made out of stone. So they must've had something here as far as landscaping, but they had this big stone circle, these big boulders. And this was kind of the centerpiece here. And the train ride looped right around it. You can still see the, you know, the curvature of it. And then it would have went back and picked up with a straight rail heading back to where it came from. So Lover's Loop, Lover's Island, whatever you want to call it, was here. It was the most remote, far away spot of the train ride. Very similar if you do go to Knobles, how you take the Pioneer train ride back into the woods where they have these squirrel feeding stations. That's like the most furthest remote spot of that train ride. That's how this was here. And there's even some more blocks for the coaster. So the coaster, if you division it would be here, the turnaround loop back here and supports extended all the way back here near the train ride. I was just looking around a little bit and somebody placed what appears to be a brake shoe, brake pad, and looks like maybe some foot pegs or grips. But we do have one more thing to check out before we continue on with the rest of the park. And it's over there. And it's a really fascinating culvert that goes underneath the Erie Railroad line. But before we do that, I do want to take just a few moments to talk about my mode of transportation. So today I'm riding on the U-Bike S4. Now U-Bike is a company that reached out to me. I've never worked with them before. They said, hey, we have this bike. Would you like to try it out? 
And I said, sure, why not? It looks kind of interesting. And I figured a place like this would be ideal to see how it performs. Now looking at it, you may be wondering, is that an e-bike? Is that an electric moped? Is that an electric motorcycle? What is it? Well, it is indeed classified as an e-bike. You can pedal it like a traditional bike, but it is designed and styled after an electric moped or a motorcycle. So the styling stands apart from the others. It doesn't look like your traditional e-bike, but it does function like one. So just to cover a few specs and details about it, this is a e-bike that has a really powerful motor. Rear hub motor of 1000 watts, plenty of power. Powering it is a 48 volt, 25 amp hour battery. It is removable and rechargeable, obviously. <laughs> Handlebars up here, we do have a few things going on. Three button design, M button is your mode button, long press on and off. You toggle through it, we'll show you your odometer, trip, voltage, current, and time the bike has been on. Five pedal assist modes, battery meter with percentage, and your speedometer dedicated headlight button and horn button so when the bike is powered on you do have daytime running lights as you can see the ring of light there and then you toggle it on you have a big bright headlight very similar to what you see on a motorcycle electronic horn over here is your seven speed shimano gear system and your half twist throttle Lots of landscape too. You could put phone mounts, camera mounts, speakers, lights, whatever you want to do. And the handlebars are adjustable as far as reach. You could make them farther or closer. Grips are rubber. They do feel decent. We do have a really big banana style seat like on the banana bikes. So the seat, this back part does come extra and separate, but you do have to mount it and install it, but it is included. But it gives you plenty of seating room if you want to sit closer or farther away or even strap something to the back part you can do that. It is riding on 20 by four inch wide fat tires, does have front and rear suspension, front and rear fenders. Here is your rear suspension right here. It actually is so far a really comfortable ride. It's handling bumps and bounces really well, but there is something I don't like about this, which I'm gonna tell you in just a second. Now the bike does weigh 76 pounds with the battery included, so it's not overly heavy but it can handle a payload up to 400 pounds. If you're a larger rider, or you're carrying a lot of gear with you, like in a backpack, and you're on the heavier side, this can handle it. Now you can't adjust the height of the seat, but you can adjust how far back on the seat you do sit. Now the thing I've been noticing, you may have heard it in the video, and it's this. You hear that noise? And that is the battery wiggling around over bumps, bounces, and cracks. Now, my first test ride at home, it was doing it, and I thought maybe it was loose. So I took the battery off, I tightened down everything as tight as it could go, it still does it. So this is not the greatest design or mounting for this battery. It seems like it needs to be strapped down or needs some type of dampener put in there because it just rattles around. So it is more or less just frustrating. It doesn't affect the performance of the bike. After a while, you do tune it out, but it is something I did notice right away. It stands out to me, and they hopefully can rectify that somehow, but there's nothing you could do unless you're riding on super smooth road. It is going to make noise. Now, this does have an estimated range of 75 miles. That is dependent on the rider's size, terrain, and pedal assist mode. I would say realistically, you're probably looking around 40 to 50 miles unless you're a really lightweight rider, not doing any hills, and pedaling most of the time. You could probably get over 60 miles. Someone like me, 40 to 50, I'm estimating. It does have a top speed of 28 miles per hour, fairly fast. And the throttle does work in conjunction with pedal assist mode. So pedal assist one will go the slowest. Pedal assist five, full throttle, will go the fastest of 28 miles an hour. <clears throat> and so far, I think it's handling pretty well. I haven't run into any major issues. I've ridden on sand dirt, stone, a little bit of mud, grass, and it's handling it really well. The motor is more than a powerful to handle some hills, to just jet around, and I like just using just the throttle. I mean, this is not a bike you're buying to do a lot of pedaling on. It's more or less just for fun and leisure, for just hitting the throttle and going. Does not have the quick release rod for the front wheel, so it doesn't fold up, isn't easily 
collapsible or transportable, but if you have a bike rack, a truck, or a large SUV, this is the general shape and size and weight, 76 pounds if you do need to lift it up. As we make our way around for the rest of this video, I will see how the bike is performing. If any issues do develop, I will indeed share them with you. But I do want to thank U-Bike for reaching out to me and allowing me to do a real world test with it to see how it performs in an environment like this. And so far, I like it. It's comfortable. It's not perfect. It has some flaws, but overall, it's a decent performing bike. Fun to ride, and it looks pretty cool. If you do want to get more information and to get the latest pricing, just check the link provided down below in the description. All right, we're going to take it right here and head up towards the rails. And I'll show you what's hiding just over here. Look at that. That is a pretty awesome culvert that goes underneath the Erie Railroad line. Not going to spend much time here because we do have more to see, but as you can tell, it does go in straight and then bends to the right. So you can't see light coming through, but when you look straight on, it is dark. But it is constructed out of stone. It is big enough to walk through. I have walked through it more than once. I have videos on that, so you can check it out. But there is a swamp on the other side, and that allows the water to come through underneath the Erie Railroad. But this is not the only culvert that's back here. There's another one further down under the Erie line they actually did some swimming at. So... If you want to find those videos, just check my culvert playlist down below in the description. Oh, look at that. This is good timing. If they ever bring the air show back, this would be a decent spot to watch it. So on the left hand side here is a road, which loosely resembles one. And this road served a couple purposes. We're gonna stop here and talk about it. Just to show you where we're looking, the Red Barn Theater was over in this direction. Again, various platforms, footings, foundations, stonework. And this side is something that a lot of people love to see. But this road served two purposes. Number one, it connected the park from the main park where most of the rides were down to the lake, but also served as a ride passage. If you guys know what an amphibious vehicle is, it was called a duck. And it was a vehicle that people would sit in, the driver would drive them down basically coasting at a fast high rate of speed and eventually splashing into the lake. And then it would take passengers for a ride around the lake, come back out, drive up the hill and get the next group of riders. So I came down this hill at a high rate of speed and as you can imagine, it wasn't very safe. Now I'm not gonna put any information out there that I'm not aware of. I think I remember hearing about an accident. I don't know the specifics on that, but I think an accident may have happened but it doesn't surprise me based on the location and how fast the vehicle goes and how big it is. Someone very well could have gotten hurt. So the stonework does continue all along the hill here. But back here, as we venture inwards, is something that I love seeing in person, checking out, and getting photos of. Now people have altered this area a little bit. They have a little hangout camp spot here fire pit but look at these these are fantastic stone couches now they're a little worse for the wear you know they've been sitting out here in the elements for decades but they're still very much intact and holding up really well even so far as having the armrest so this is more almost like a love seat type of couch and there is, I believe, a single one, or a couple singles over here. Yeah, right here. These are more or less just like little sitting chairs for one individual. Maybe two right there. And these are built right into the stone wall. I love seeing these, and the reason these were here is because, again, 
this wasn't here this was open you're able to see the lake basically offered you views of the lake it was a nice sitting area whether there was water skiing the high dive act whatever it was this was an area to come and enjoy it away from the water a little bit of shade probably but I just really love this area ever since I found it I've always been fascinated by to see that a park designed something like this just for guests to sit and enjoy it's not like a traditional park bench these are hand built out of stone and they fit in this environment it looks like they belong here but whoever's coming here now to enjoy it well they got a decent spot they got plenty of places to sit without a doubt as we crest the hill there's a lot of things up here that used to exist and I'm not going to point out everything, but off to the left here would have been the Ferris wheel and the turnaround point for the sky ride. We're going to head over this direction to show you where a third coaster used to be. Now this road right here was called Games Row. That's because lining the sides of this road were numerous stands that had carnival style games. So Games Row was right here. And this is also the location where you can find the remnants of the most recent coaster that operated here at Rocky Glen that went by the name of the Mighty Jet Coaster or Mighty Lightning Coaster. It was built in 1958, operated up until the day the park closed. And it is essentially buried under its own rubble. So if you look right there, those planks of wood that are curved, that's part of the coaster track. There's various parts of steel and metal sticking out as part of the coaster rail. So here on up is the coaster buried under itself. It was demolished after the auction, which I believe was in 1988. So it is sad to see its demises here. Mighty Lightning, or Mighty Jet Coaster, is right here and lasted from 1958 up until 1987 when the park did officially close. We're now up near the front entrance of the park, which would have had that castle-style entrance, which was located right around here, maybe possibly right where we are. So looking over here, they did have some parking. The Mighty Jet, Mighty Lightning Coaster was, was right there, as well as, I believe, a Spider-type ride, possibly a Merry Mixer. I think the rides may have changed over time, but they did have a few rides here right in front of the Jet Coaster. And over here, straight ahead of us, would have been the... I guess you could consider indoor go-kart track. They had go-karts, gas-powered, but they were kind of inside because they had a roof over it, so they went around in a circle. That was located right around here. That was like an Indy Speedway type thing. But now I'm going to show you something else that's rather fascinating because there is still parts of it here. How many of you remember the antique car ride? I bet many of you do. Some amusement parks do have them, like Knobles and Hershey. Well, Rocky Glen had their own version and some interesting history tied to it as well. So as we come down this little trail here, which is a walking path, we're going to see signs of it. So as we walk in here amongst these big trees, we're going to see signs from the past. I see some posts here. Do you see some flat terrain? But if you look closely, look what's on the ground. The rail. That's the rail that the antique cars rode on. They had those center wheels to help keep it on track. It rode directly on here. So it is still existing. As well as the concrete pad, which is buried under debris here. But if you kick it away... There's the concrete right there. So primarily it is still here. 
even if you look through, there's more rail. Actually, we'll go over there and check it out. Now, people have ripped up section of the rail because there used to be more of it. And I did notice that it was starting to disappear over time, probably for scrap. But here it is. The rail goes up and around the other side over here. And it went all the way down there. It was actually a good size course or track. So I don't know the exact path of it, but it did kind of curve around, went down there. You know, it made some different shapes and turns, but I think the loading unloading area was up here somewhere, but it was a really nice track and course, if you want to say. The unique thing is that these antique cars lived on. Once the park closed, that wasn't it for them. Knobles Amusement Resort bought the antique cars and started operating them at Knobles. But over time, the cars you know, became outdated, run down, needing work. So slowly over time, they started getting replaced. As of today, 2023, I don't believe any of the antique cars at Knobles are the ones from Rocky Glen. The only one that still exists is the one that's there where you could take your picture in it. It's just a prop model. That was one of the old, original Rocky Glen cars. But all of them have been replaced. But just to see though where they used to run and operate, and that the rail's still here and it's still, I mean, if you came through here with um, like a skid steer or like a small loader, you could easily open this back up and clear it back out. Now here the rail has been ripped up, but the path still continues. And I've always been kind of intrigued as to how the exact course went. You know, whether it came down this direction or went up that way, but what we're looking at is the whole entire thing. I believe prior to this was a mini golf course. I remember seeing some things that people shared that a mini golf course was here. Later on, it got developed into the antique car ride. This will bring us down to the lower parking lot. So right down here is basically the outskirts of the park. So looking where those trees would be would be the Mountain Dips coaster. Back in the time frame, you'd also see the Million Dollar Coaster. You'd also have the Laurel Line trolley that would have continued straight out here with the loading and loading station up there. And of course, various things up here 
in the upper main part of the park. They have three parking lots. They have the main lot, which is where the main entrance was. They do have the upper lot where we started today's video and the lower lot, so they had ample parking. But today, nature is just reclaiming. No one knows for certain what the future is going to hold. It has always been rumored that they're going to develop this area. Thankfully, it hasn't happened yet. But as we also heard, they were going to repair the dam. That hasn't happened yet either. People often ask too, can you come here and walk around? Well, technically it is private property. It always has been ever since the park closed. But people do come here. They will continue to come here unless it's permanently fenced off or developed or something else. The other question too is, is it safe to come here? Well, that is all up to individual opinion. I feel safe coming here. I've been coming here for most of my adult life. And yes, there's been time there's been questionable people. Times there's been parties. But those times are actually in the past. When the park closed to say up to maybe five to 10 years ago, this place was heavily visited by people like ATVs, off-road vehicles, having bonfires, lighting up fireworks, swimming, fishing. This was visited by a lot of people, especially in the hot summers. The lake would have sometimes almost 100 people in it swimming, even though the park was closed. Now, it's pretty quiet. I'm here on a Thursday morning. I'm the only person here. I heard one ATV earlier and that was it. So if you do come here, you are coming at your own risk. Obviously, be respectful of the land and the property. There are places that are posted for no parking, so you do want to be vigilant of that so you don't get towed. You don't want to dump anything here, discard anything. Just come here, look around, take pictures, and enjoy it. But as mentioned, there's not a whole lot to see. But if you know where to look, there are things to see. With that being said, I do want to thank you for coming along for today's revisit of the famous Rocky Glen Amusement Park that did close in 1987. And just to kind of bring you up to speed with that, it closed end of season 1987 with it planned to open in 1988. It never happened. So it closed and in the off season, it was determined they're not going to reopen it. And there is speculation out there and rumors and personal thoughts and opinions about why it closed. The things that I come to learn is two reasons. One is declining attendance because they weren't bringing in any new rides. They had mostly carnival style rides. All the major coasters were gone except for the mighty jet coaster. That was the only main coaster draw. And also rising insurance costs. So lack of innovation and growing as a park, rising costs, declining attendance was the ultimate demise of this park and why it never reopened. 1988 was the auction. And even up until then, there was numerous fires here, all arson that really hurt them financially. And it was just the beginning of the end, so to speak. But I do want to thank my friend Andy for not only educating me on all the fascinating history here at the park, but also for helping me with today's video with the dates and pictures I did share throughout the video. And also for running the Facebook memories group. I don't know how many members it has now. It's well over 15,000. And primarily all those people are people that either visited here or worked here when the park was in operation. So consider checking it out. The links will be provided down below as well as my Rocky Glen playlist where you can see my previous tours here, including the underwater tour and when the lake was first drained and see how it evolved over time. And again, the bike performed good. No issues, no flaws. It got me where I need to go and just a little noisy on the battery, but it's a comfortable ride and it's fun to ride. So you can always check it out for yourself if you want to get one. Thanks for watching everyone. And until next time, I'll see you in the next video.